Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Terry, and I've got the honour um, of being the head of field programmes for Dara Wildlife. So it's my job to, to look after a number of our, uh, well, all of them, hopefully, uh, field mm -hmm. conservation projects around the world. Um, personally, I also want to give a, a real genuine note of thanks to uh, Matthew and Thrive for enabling us to hold um, this talk here tonight. It's a fantastic venue. And to locate Jersey also for uh, uh, enabling you to have the drinks that hopefully you've been enjoying so far. Um, it's probably a bit risky for Durrell to be uh, hosting an evening on amphibians because in some eyes, they're not always the most high-profile species. Maybe it's quite characteristic of Durrell, in fact. We tend to work with the weird and wonderful. Um, but these are very, very important species. And, and hopefully, you, you saw in um, the film earlier on some of the reasons why frogs and uh, all amphibians are so important to us. And there was a headline in there, which I don't know if you saw, which I thought was a great headline unfortunate story that said, frog goes extinct, the media yawns. And, and that kind of captures, the article was really not just about that particular species, but really about how, how do we make a populace care about species in which they might know nothing about? Because for all the, the iconic species that are in trouble in this world, many thousands are facing extinction. And, um, actually none more so than amphibians. And that species was this one. That species is no more. This was the last individual that died in September this year. And many species are going this way. In fact, um, amphibians are the most threatened vertebrate group in the world. We think there are about 7,500 <coughs> amphibians, and about 5,000 of those um, have been assessed. Uh, and there's a sufficient data that we can, we can actually um, give a good, get a good idea of, of how well they're doing. And about 42% of those are threatened with extinction. It's almost half. And that's quite shocking. You compare that to birds, 13% of birds. You compare it to mammals, about 26% of mammals. Those are bad enough. But when it comes to amphibians, we're, we're facing a real crisis on our hands. <laughs> And what's feeding that crisis? Well, unfortunately, amphibians are suffering from all the problems that we, we know um, very well. But in this case, uh, particularly habitat loss, the introduction of diseases in particular, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later in the talk. But they're also being driven by pollution, by climate change, by development, the introduction of non-native species, and direct over-exploitation. So these guys are getting hit from all sides, really. And I think from our speakers, you'll get a sense of the different challenges and the different threats their species are facing. But also in the film, you, you heard um, about the, the biological importance of amphibians, the role they play in their ecosystems, either eating or being eaten, the, the role they play towards us um, in terms of potentials for medicine and, and biological control. I always want to pull out their cultural importance. This is a Bal Balinese frog mask, but they appear in cultures all over the world, from ancient Egypt and Greece through to uh, the Haida people of, of Canada, where they're symbols of wealth and prosperity. And actually, I was with a colleague yesterday from Assam in northern India. And he told me about the frog weddings. So in India, in Assam, to appease the rain god Baran, you will, the villagers will hold a frog wedding, which I thought was symbolic, but no, it's literal. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get a male frog and a female frog and have a, a very big ceremony. <clears throat> the point is, they recognize the position, the role of frogs in the, in the rains. They understand the sound of the frogs coming out when, when it's raining. They associate that. And it's always formed a very um, important part of their culture. So for me, the questions we should be asking are not why should we protect frogs. It's how we should save them instead. 
And that's really what we want to talk about tonight. The other thing I wanted to say is, for most of us, and maybe a lot of you at the same time, frogs are often the first contact we have with nature. Primary schools bring frog spawn into, into their classrooms and follow the development of these, these uh, tadpoles. Kids love chasing frogs around streams, and I'm usually dragging my children out of a stream somewhere. They're a very important connection to our first experiences with nature. So if I was going to characterize the sort of statements that we should make, we must save our amphibians. And what I hope we can do tonight is tell you that we can. And actually, what we want to show you is that we are. I did want to touch very quickly on why are we particularly focused on amphibians. Our SAFE program, which is what we're talking about tonight, is one of our sort of global programs. Our whole organization aims its, its, all its resources at this. Well, right from the beginning, um, Gerald Durrell had this idea that a zoo was much more than a zoo, that actually it should be there to protect incredibly threatened species, it should be training people in the field, it should be having an impact in the field, and it should be asking scientific questions. And our organization follows that model today. So we are driven by our science. It helps shape where we go, but it measures whether we're having an impact or not. We intervene directly in the field. We use the expertise from our staff in Jersey and also interacting with captive centers around the world. And we try and build sustainable solutions through our training programs. And the reason why I want to mention this is you will see these elements coming out in the talks that follow. So this is our global program. And, and one thing I should say is I'm using the word we a lot. And in that, I'm not only referring to the many individual people who are involved um, working all over the world, but really the community of organizations and institutions. All these projects are partnerships. They're partnerships um, with local communities all the way up to international conservation organizations and international donors. So please don't think somehow this is you know, happening, we are on our own doing this. This is a global community of people trying to work together, and we're incredibly grateful for all the partnerships that help us. This is our goal. It's the wordiest thing I'll show you. Um, but what we want, we, we set ourselves a target. By 2020, we want to be um, improving the survival of amphibians in 10 key locations in four of the most important amphibian regions of the world. And I'll tell you a little bit later on how, how well we're doing to meet our, our target. And we chose a series of sites where we thought we could have an impact. And what we did is we overlaid areas of extreme amphibian richness with real threat, where the pressure is greatest, but also where we can act. So we've got the tropical Andes of South America, the Western Caribbean, Madagascar, and a site that we are uh, soon to explore in Sri Lanka. And to have that impact, we have four particular ways in which we want to do that. We start by trying to improve our understanding of the situation, trying to understand the threats and how we can respond. In many cases, we need to really utilize those hands-on management skills that we've got, working with captive populations um, to try and, and to, to rescue these species. Our safeguards are the people who are going to take these projects forward in the future. These are the people we're trying to train, the conservationists we're trying to help, the, how we're trying to build networks of people who are all mad keen about saving frogs. But we also need to get the message out. And there are many ways in which we can do that. We want to influence policy at a national level in the countries and with, uh, within which we're active. We want to influence this, the conservation community. The crisis facing frogs isn't necessarily new. It's not a surprise to us. In fact, we've known for quite a while. But getting international support and building momentum 
has been a challenge. And I really feel, actually, in, in recent years, um, we've been able to, the, the global community has been able to make great strides. But we also try to publish our results and disseminate um, our news. So we believe that's a model that works. And you'll see, keep an eye on the symbols, you'll see uh, reference to them uh, coming up later. So that's really our strategy, that's the plan, that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, but I want to bring this alive for you. So we, we're very lucky to have three speakers who really know their stuff. Unlike me, he's winging it most of the time. <laughs> um, we're going to start with a talk from Arturo Munoz from Bolivia. Um, Arturo is going to talk a little bit about his relationship with Durrell. We've had a long relationship with Arturo, and it's been um, uh, a fantastic one. But really focus on his work with the Lake Titicaca um, water frog. <coughs> we're then going to move to the Caribbean and hear from Mike Hudson, who recently um, completed his PhD on the mountain chicken, uh, the decline of that species, which I think holds the dubious honor of one of the fastest species declines ever. Um, but really, how he's used all that knowledge, how he's been able to look at our responses to shape a future direction, and that's what he's going to be talking about. And finally, we're going to end with Jeff Dawson. And it's a bit of a misnomer, because he should actually be doing this, uh, because Jeff runs our SAFE program. But he's going to tell us about our capacity development work in, in Madagascar in particular. So that's enough from me. Um, I'm going to now hand over to Arturo, who's going to tell us about safe checks and the work happening in Bolivia. Arturo. <coughs>